We're going to begin in Mishnah Gimel, Perik Aleph of Pirke Ovis, Mishnah Gimel. Ethics of our fathers, good advice from people who, found, who are the foundational figures of our Messiah, of our tradition, of our heritage. And we learned last week in Mishnah Base, the Mishnah spoke about Shimon HaTzadik. Well, Antigonus Ish Soichai Kibel Mishimon HaTzadik. Who was Antigonus? He was a man. Ish. What does it mean when it says Ish? The Mishnah, when it uses the word Ish, and generally speaking, the word Ish in classical Hebrew means a sophisticated, important person. Not just a random figure. He's an Ish. It's a distinguished person. Antigonus was an ish, a distinguished person who was at those at the time of the beginning of the Talmudic era, at the time when the Mishnah obviously hadn't yet been created. It was only written hundreds of years later. However, these were the foundational figures of Mishnais and Antigonus Ish Soichai, we're going to see in a minute, had an unusual role to play, particularly because of what he taught in this Mishnah. Historically, he was a very important person, but he was a Talmud of Shimon HaTzadik. What was it that he taught us in the Mishnah that's quoted in his name at the beginning of Perik Aleph of Perik Avos? Kibel Mishimon HaTzadik, he received his Torah, all his knowledge he received from Shimon HaTzadik. He became the generational oracle. He was the person from whom the next generation received their Torah and through whom the Torah of Shimon HaTzadik and everyone that preceded him came through. Hu Oime, he said as follows, Al tihiyu ka'avodim hamashamshin es horav. Don't be like avodim. What's an eved? An eved, I know that we're going to translate it as servant. That's not what it means. Avodim, in classical Hebrew, and by the way, in all ancient culture, means slave. Don't be like a slave. Hamashamshin es harav, who works for the master. Amanas le kabal pras, in order to receive the pras. The word pras is an interesting word. What does the word pras mean? So, we know that in modern Hebrew it means prize. What is the normal word for payment in Hebrew? Schar. Amanos lekabel schar is what it should have said, not amanos lekabel pras. Don't be like a slave who works for a master in order to receive one's wages, one's due, whatever that may be. But that's not the way the Mishnah expresses itself. That's not what... Antigonus Ish said, he said something else slightly. We're going to look into that. Elohevu ka'avodim hamashamshin esarav sheloi amanas lekabel pras. What you need to be is ka'avodim, like a slave. Really? Are we avodim? We need to be like slaves? Loi lekabel pras, not to receive the pras, the prize, the reward. Pras, that's a good, a good translation for us in English, for the word pras is not prize, it's reward. We should be like slaves, but we shouldn't be like slaves in order to receive a reward. We're going to have to unpack that. How do I behave like a slave? What would a slave behave like if he was intending or desiring to receive a reward? And how would a slave who didn't want to receive a reward behave? We need to know that in order to understand Antignois Ishsoichai. And the main thing is that you need to have your relationship with God motivated and underpinned by Yiras Shamayim, by fear of heaven. And I'm reading here the Perish Nimtes Avoidaschem Shalema. As a result of that, your service of God will be complete. It will be total. You won't be like someone who wants to receive a reward. You will work for Hashem in the way that He wants. And indeed, says the parish, your schar, 
your payment, not the pras, will be double le'osid lovoi in the time to come. In other words, after life, in the olam ha'emes, in the olam haba, in the world to come, your prize will be extremely valuable. What you will receive as a reward for what you've done will be worth all the effort that you have put into it. By the way, what's the problem with the world to come? It's not tangible. It's not real. If I tell you that you're going to receive a benefit, but not in your lifetime, you're going to make an investment, and that investment is only going to pay off after you die. How motivated are you to make that investment? If I could tell you that you're going to make an investment and you're going to make the money, half the money, we just said that you're going to double it after you die, but you can make half the money, by the way, a very good return, but you're still going to be alive. What are you more likely to do? You're more likely to make an investment when you can realize the return on your investment, when you can still appreciate it. What is the point of making an investment if you can't appreciate the return, if you can't take any benefit from it? What is the point of receiving any benefits from Hashem in Olam Haba? I don't live in Olam Haba. I live here. I live in Los Angeles, California. And wherever you are, that's where you live. It doesn't matter if it's in Stony Brook, New York, or if it's in London, or if it's in Jerusalem. Wherever you are, that's where you live. That's where your life is taking place. You want to receive the Sakhar, whatever that may be, in a place where you can use it, you can utilize it. Um, and of course, you'll say to yourself, I'm only going to utilize it for the best possible things. I, I'm, I'm not going to use it for the wrong things. What's the point of receiving something that is an olam haba? We're going to talk about that as well in a slightly sideways fashion. Let me just finish the perish. V'chein omru b'yerushalmi. This is what it says in the Jerusalem Talmud. It's in Yerushalmi Soita Perik Hey Halacha Hey Kosuv Echad Oimer. Someone said Vahafta. Did you say Shema this morning? You're going to say it tonight. How do we begin the Shema? After we say Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, what do we say? You should love the Lord your God. That's another posuk, but you need to fear Hashem. So which is it? Do you need to love Hashem? Or do you need to fear Hashem? means you need to love Hashem. And a few psukim later, that's in Posuk Hey. A few psukim later in Posuk Yugimel, it says, You should fear Hashem. How is it possible that you need to do it with Ahava and to do it with love? So the, um, the answer is that if you come to a moment where there is hatred, if you feel hateful, you should know that you love and it's not possible for somebody who loves to hate. If you have unadulterated love, even if you are going through an, a period of extreme pain, that love is still there. It may be buried beneath anger and anxiety and all the other emotions you may be feeling. But if you unpack everything, and you get to the essence, to the core, you love Hashem. You need to work on yourself to find in you a love of God. That should be your go-to emotion. Ultimately, that has to be rule number one. It has to be the primary directive. That's it. And then, if you do something out of fear, the other thing, other side of it is that sometimes love can lead to over-familiarity. Love can lead to people doing things that perhaps they shouldn't do, because they take advantage of the closeness that they may have with a 
person that they love. No, no. Alongside the love, you need to have yira. You need to have fear, trepidation. You need to know that Hashem is Hashem. And you need to find a way of matching these two emotions in you between Ahava and Yira, between loving Hashem and having fear of Hashem so that your relationship with Hashem is complete and it is healthy. Now we're going to go back to Antignos Ish Soichai and try and understand what it means to be like an Eved. It's a very interesting analogy because I would have thought if you're going to say, how should you behave towards Hashem? Perhaps you should say you shouldn't be like a Ben. Or you shouldn't be like a worker, an Oived, a son or a worker, an Eved, a slave. Sounds a bit extreme. Why would I want to be like a slave? But by the way, it doesn't say you are a slave. It says Ke, Eved, like a slave. You're not a slave, by the way. You are a child of God. You are somebody who is, um, who is in uh, a deep and profound relationship with Hashem. That's what you are. However, at the same time, you have to be ke'evet. What does it mean? We're going to look at that now. So, the Rambam in Perish HaMishnai says, And then we're going to go to the idea of a pras. There's a big difference between a pras, a reward, and a schar, a payment. What is the difference between a reward and a payment? When I do work for someone, what is the expectation? By the way, it's halacha. It's a a mitzvah in the Torah. If somebody works for you, at the end of the day, if they're a um, pol yoy, there's somebody who works for a day, you have to pay them right away. Why? Because they're owed the sakhar. Whatever is due to them as payment has to be paid to them right away. That's a sakhar. What's a reward? What is the expectation of a reward? Not sure if there is an expectation of a reward. A reward is something which is, I know that perhaps I shouldn't be getting it, wouldn't it be nice if I was recognized for all the wonderful things I did and how hard I worked? Can you imagine that? That every time you did a mitzvah to Hashem, every time you kept Shabbos, you're saying to yourself, I want a pat on the back. I want Hashem to tell me how marvelous I am. Okay, I know that I have to do what Hashem tells me and I'm not going to get schar for it. I'm not going to get schar in this world. But at the very least, I should get a bit of a pras. I should get some reward, some recognition. Look how many people don't keep Shabbos properly. Look how many people don't keep kosher. Look how many people speak Lashon Hara and I didn't speak any Lashon Hara. I should get some press for that, shouldn't I? Surely that's dollars in the bank. Says Antignos Ish Soichai. No, no. Don't be like an Eved Amanos Lekabel Pras. Yes, you don't deserve schar, and that's a certain level. There's some people, by the way, who won't do anything unless they know what they're going to get in return. Have you met people like that? They keep a little black book, and in the black book it says, I did this for that one, and therefore I want that in return. If they didn't give me any return, I'm never doing anything for them again. That's a schar situation. Tit for tat. There's a yin and a yang. There is... My action, and then there's your reaction. Uh, that's not a relationship I have with Hashem, okay? I'm, I'm already at a higher level. I'm, I'm at the level where I understand. I'm not going to get anything. I'm an Eved, after all. I'm a slave. I'm not somebody who's worthy or deserving. However, even a slave sometimes gets a bit of a recognition. A thank you. Somehow, I'm going to be acknowledged for what I'm doing. No. If that's the way you do your mitzvahs, you're not doing them properly. By the way, Antignus Ishtoicha is not talking about human nature. He's talking about it in the breach. How is it that human beings always, always expect to be recognized and acknowledged? It's much better to have a relationship with Hashem where that is not the expectation. Loi almanas le pras. That's the highest level. You know, elsewhere in 
Shacharis and Mincha, I'm doing the sixth parak of Pirkei Ovis. And Ramea, right at the beginning of the sixth parak of Pirkei Ovis, in the Brisa, he says, you should learn Torah Lishma. And the Mepharshim ask, what's wrong with learning Torah Shaloi Lishma? After all, Chazal tell us, Shaloi Lishma, Ba Lishma. If you don't learn it for the right reasons, ultimately you'll learn it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Rabbi Meir is not talking to those people. Rabbi Meir is talking it to, to the people who know, understand the difference between Lishma and Loi Lishma. Are you learning for ulterior motives? Is the Torah that you study only there so that you can get kudos? Do you know how fantastic you are? You learned so much Torah. You're such a great scholar. You're so knowledgeable. You're so amazing. People will give you respect, you'll get a job. No, that's not the reason to learn Torah. The reason to learn Torah is because Lishma. Because Hashem wants you to learn Torah. Vadibar Tabam. It's a posik in Dvarim. You need to speak in Torah. Beshif Techobavesecha. When you're sitting in your house. Velech Techovaderech. When you're traveling on a journey. Beshachbacha. When you go to bed. Uvukumecha. And when you get up. Your love for Hashem has no time and no place and no limitations. It's limitless and it's boundless. That is what a true relationship is. When you love, you love your spouse, you love your child, you love your parent. Is there anything you won't do at any time, day or night? You're a bit like an Eved, aren't you? When it comes to those relationships. When your child needs you, your child is crying in the night. Your child is sick and needs to go to hospital. Your child needs help with their education. Your child needs help because they're going through a difficult patch emotionally. You're busy with something else. I I'm busy right now. No. When it's your child, it's love. You have a relationship with your child. There's no limitation. Everything else falls by the side. And the more pronounced the crisis, the more time you will spend. What about everything else in your life? What about the schar? What about the pras? Where's the schar and the pras in it? No, I'm not sure that you'll get. By the way, if in your relationship with your children you're looking for schar and you're looking for pras, keep looking. It doesn't come too fast. It's loy almanas le kabo pras. That's the relationship. Now multiply that. Multifold. A hundred times. A thousand times. Your relationship with Hashem. And Tignas Ish says, do you know what it means to have a relationship with Hashem? Ka'avodim, you're like a slave. You're not like somebody who ha who's master of his own destiny. Loi le kabel pras. You can't do it on that basis because that's not a relationship. Oh, yes, that's a relationship you may have with your boss. You may have it when you go into a shop. You give a bit of money. They give you the product. You walk out. You have your receipt. If you want to return it, you take the receipt. You can return it. They give you your money back. Oh, that's a, that makes a lot of sense. That's a commercial relationship. That's economics. There's no economics when it comes to your relationship with Hashem. Your relationship with Hashem, says Antigonus Ish Soichai, is... Do you know what it is? Loi amanas le kabel pras. You can't have a relationship with Hashem where you think you're getting something in return because that's not the relationship. Of course, there are people who have that relationship. And by the way, it doesn't mean you can't ask, ask Hashem for something. Of course, we ask every day for, for, uh, from Hashem. We ask Him for all kinds of things. That's how we begin. Please, give me das. Baruch atah Hashem, chayin in hadas. Somebody sick in your family? Rafainu Hashem, v'nei rafei. Baruch atah Hashem, rafei chayli amo Yisrael. I'm asking Hashem, can you give us a rafu shalema? What happens if he didn't? That means he doesn't have a relationship with you? Does that mean he doesn't care about you? No, it's got, one thing's got nothing to do with the other. Of course, he is the bayre oilam. Of course, he's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Of course, he can do anything. But my relationship, my davening is not going to be affected because he did or didn't answer my refa'enu this morning. That's not the way it works. At the end of Shemun Esra, I'm going to bow down. I'm going to say, Moidim anachnu lach. Thank you, Hashem. You've done everything for me. Baruch ato Hashem. Hatoiv shimcha ulecha no'el ahoydois. 
your name is fantastic and the only thing that I can do is thank you. That is the relationship with Hashem. That's what it means to be an Eved. You must be an Eved, but not an Eved who's looking for a pat on the back. You must learn Torah, but not because you're looking for that Torah to give you some access somewhere that's good for networking, that somehow you're going to get a bit of a good position somewhere. That's not what it means to study Torah. Torah in and of itself is valuable. It's valuable because you can have a relationship with Hashem. That in and of itself is worth it. Now I want to tell you that this power, it's a powerful lesson, right? You agree with me? It's a very, very powerful lesson. It was so powerful that Antigonus Ish had two students. Here's the Jewish history piece. One of them was called Tzadok and the other one was called Baisus. They were so taken with this idea that they said, one of the things that they said, it evolved, but one of the things this began it, they said, you know what our Rebbe taught us? That you mustn't do mitzvahs and mustn't have a relationship with Hashem. Amanas le kabel pras. Therefore, there's no such thing as reward. They took it to the extreme. They said there is no such thing as a reward. And they developed, each of them, a sect of Jews, one of which was known as Tzidukim, Sadducees. And the other one developed a sect called Baisusim, Boethusians. And they didn't believe in an afterlife. They said, your neshama is born, you serve God because you serve God, and at the end of your life it's over, you're getting nothing. The reason you serve God, it was very, very stark, very basic. The theology of the Bothusians and the Sadducees was very, very harsh. There's no such thing as schar, there's no such thing as pras. Now, that's not what Antigonus Ish meant. That's not our Messiah. That's how, unfortunately, two of his Talmidim took his teaching and abused it and misused it, reinterpreted it and misinterpreted it until they developed into two distinct groups that caused untold trouble for the Jewish people. The Sadducees and Boethusians caused incredible problems for the Jewish people. But we understand the Mishnah. We know what it means. You need to love Hashem. You need to know that Hashem is behind you and He's with you. He's for you and will support you. And if you say Rafa'inu, it may very well be that the Rafur Shalema is on its way. Baruch Atah Hashem, Ama Yisrael. However, if that is the basis, the fundament of your relationship with Hashem, you've got the wrong end of the stick. That's not what God wants from you. God puts your neshama here to self-improve so that when you hand back your neshama at the end of the rental period and you hand it back and they do all the checks, you know, how they do in the, in the, when you rent a car, they go around and they look if there's any scratches and dents and how much mileage you did and whether there's anything in the trunk. When you get that check at the end of your life, your neshama will be in a better situation that it was when you received it. Its purity will be enhanced and you will have enhanced Hashem's world. That is the purpose of our existence. That is what Antigonus Ish wanted to teach us thousands of years later, two and a half thousand years after this idea was taught. He lived sometime probably about 2300 years ago, 2400 years ago, that's when he lived. And he taught us that we should never be like Avodim who expect something in return. What we need to be is like Avodim, totally committed, totally beholden, without in any situation expecting that Hashem will give us something which is in any way due to us, nothing is due to us. It doesn't mean we're not getting anything. But nothing is due to us. That is Mishnah Gimel of Perik Ovis, Perik Ovis Mishnah of Perik Aleph. And Mitzah Hashem, next podcast, next video, will be teaching Mishnah Dalad. And I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for joining me.